Hello everyone, Soren here. Welcome to a video where all the Slender Tubby's 3 enemies will be ranked from best to worst. I will be breaking down each and every aspect of the character from lore, design and overall mechanics in the game to see which characters work best for the genre. Now, when including characters, I'm gonna have to lay down a couple of rules, and they go like this. They have to be enemies for the majority of the game, they have to be pivotal characters, or they have to still be in the game. For this reason, there are a few characters who will not be mentioned on this list, such as the soldiers and the blue workers. I figured that they're only enemies once infected, and we never actually see that in the campaign. Granted, we never see most of the unique enemies in the campaign either, but all of those are made to be evil. This list will also not include the Blue Scythe fan character that was added and removed in what seemed like a day. As much as I like that design, there's no way I can include him to prevent confusion. I also have to grant an apology to all you Ron lovers out there. I know how much he means to you. Anyway, enough explaining myself, because you know at the end of the day, this doesn't matter. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy this incredibly long video. What were they thinking? Seriously, what were they thinking? Compared to all the other characters, and I mean all of them, this character makes the least sense to me. I get that there's some random lore about this being Lala's imaginary friend, but that is seriously lazy, and just opens up a whole new amount of questions, like how does she even know what humans look like? Not to mention that this is the only human character in the entire game. <sighs> I, I get that humans are canon in the Slendy Tuffies universe, but this is so forced. And I'll tell you another thing, she isn't even scary. Sure, anything can scare you if it sneaks up on you, but come on, this is not unique. There are very few things I hate about horror in general, but one thing I cannot stand is creepy long-haired girls. It's the most cliché thing in the book. Something I hate more is putting a cliché character in a game that has nothing to do with said cliché character. It's just stupid. And- wait, wait a minute. Oh, what the fu- Where have the Teletubbies gone? Welcome to Slendy Tubbies. A world of monster Teletubbies, infected custard, evil vacuum cleaners, and, uh, robots. Wait, what? So, in close relation with the ghost girl, I don't see the point of this enemy in the game. When it comes to robots, I understand that Nunu is an evil sentient AI, the announcer, I guess, could be an AI, and the security droids make sense because they were well implemented in the campaign. But these guys? I, I just don't get it. It's all well and good having something random and unique as a boss or mini-boss, but the spider droids are just so easy to kill. On top of that, it's just a dull design, and they're badly placed. Personally, I think if they did something more like The Thing, a John Carpenter film from the 80s, with the newborn's heads on spider legs, that would have been leagues above this. But you know what, I think Zero should hire me. Where have the Teletubbies gone? It's unbelievable how out of place this newborn is. When it comes to the newborn enemies in survival multiplayer mode, I can see why they had to shake things up a bit and make it feel a bit more unique, instead of making it feel like a mod or a gun hack for the original Slendy Tubbies. But a giant bull Teletubby hybrid with meteor sized fists? I hate this character so much because it actually made me start thinking about what animals are in the Slendy Tubbies universe. Do they eat animals like cattle? I don't see any cows. There were rabbits in the trailer, but that was fan servicing for fans of the original show. So, all they eat is custard, right? Custard is made from milk. So where are the cows? The custard facility doesn't have any. In fact, it seems to have torture devices instead. Is Nunu fusing cattle with newborns? Screw you, game, for making me think about where Teletubbies get their milk. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Here's an announcement for you. Why did this guy need to exist? I don't have much interesting stuff to say about this enemy because 
it's seriously bland. Even compared to all the other weird enemies, the design of this one feels more out of place than ever. The announcer's design and backstory kind of makes sense, albeit silly, but why have a miniature version just to create a mini boss? This seems like lazy game design, reusing characters to pad out the runtime and increase difficulty. So yeah, not a character I hate for any particular reason, it's just a bit of a nothing character. At least throw in some lore. Where have the Teletubbies gone? And now, literally, Hannibal Lecter. The runner newborn is the runner-up for the generic newborns, yes, pun intended, and I don't really think adding a restraint mask and a knife arm makes it any more scary. It actually, once again, feels like lazy character design. What is interesting about this character, despite being a generic newborn, they are faster, more dangerous, and Nunu, or whatever created these monstrosities, felt the need to put a mask on it. Why would a monster, created with the strict intent of killing and recruiting more of its kind, be restricted in any capacity? I mean, its arm is a knife. Probably a nitpick of mine, but I don't think this character adds much to the table. At least it isn't as out of place as the aforementioned. I would also understand if people would be upset to see this character so low on the list, considering they do actually have some use in the other game modes. But I don't know, man. It takes a lot to impress me. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Michael Bay designed this enemy. Right, so this one's not low down on the list due to its design, but more how much I hate it in the game. I swear, I can't get through one wave with these guys surrounding me. Ranged is one thing, but explosive? Not only that, but they are introduced fairly early into the run, so you better have not wasted your money on health or melee. Moving on to the design briefly, again I have to ask, what events transpired in the newborn factory that led to this one getting an inbuilt rocket launcher? Nunu must have been high as a kite when he invented that one. I think a more fitting ranged enemy in the game would be something that spits acid, or maybe more appropriately, infected custard. It's something we've already seen in the game. Another thought that came to mind was a newborn with extendable appendages. This would be both more fitting in the world and straight up nightmarish. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Phantoms, huh? Slender Tubbies 3? More like FNAF 3. Another newborn form for the bottom half of this list, don't be surprised. So here we have a newborn with darkened cracked skin and is relatively thinner and taller than the generic newborns. They can also turn invisible for some reason. I wouldn't really have a massive issue with this mechanic except for the fact that you can still hit them when they're invisible so it's almost completely pointless. Not to mention that the giant red health bars that follow them around buff their heads. Definitely not the worst newborn in survival, but hey, I have to put them somewhere on the list, right? Interestingly, the newest version of The Last Hope managed to pull off this character in such an awesome way, having a sound cue from behind only for them to disappear moments later. If they did this in the actual game, the Phantom Newborns would have been so much higher on this list. Also, I'm not strictly saying that the newborn in Last Hope is a phantom newborn, but it's the mechanic that counts. Where have the Teletubbies gone? I love this guy in campaign. Thought they would do pretty well in multiplayer. Oh, how wrong I was. He's a pretty random character for you to put in an FPS mode, but originally this guy was part of the deeper lore, first appearing as Unit 437 in the mountain section of the campaign. He was a robot sent out to kill the Yeti Tubby, possibly by the Coatmen or the military, which is a topic for a whole other day, believe me. He then, for some reason, becomes the Yeti Tubby's servant, instructed to cut down trees, keep the fire going, and cook, possibly, other Teletubbies. I'm assuming this is because Nunu has control of all robots, but I can't be entirely certain. Now, there's a line in the trivia section of the Slendy Tubby's wiki that sums up this character pretty much perfectly. As for now, Unit 437 is the sole member of a large group of generic enemies to display a personality. 
Sad, but true. I genuinely wish that this character was never implemented into survival mode because it makes him feel infinitely less interesting. He did manage to bring up another important point about this universe, which is why the artificial intelligence is so advanced. This might have something to do with the post-apocalyptic setting that the DLC brought up, but it's just food for thought, really. Where have the Teletubbies gone? This guy is not nearly as tough as he thinks he is. This is the second best design for the newborn mini-bosses in survival mode, and that's because this guy got lucky. I was originally going to place him much lower on the list, but after doing a bit of research and seeing their character models up close, I'm actually genuinely surprised how well its design worked for the series. This is mostly down to the long arms, sharp claws, and strange protruding spikes on the back. However, despite this guy's size and intimidating appearance, he isn't even that hard to kill. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Sure, they ran out of ideas, but at least it works. So this enemy was ultimately the best of the mini-bosses in multiplayer survival in my mind. That doesn't make it an exceptional character by any means, but at least the design worked well with the overall aesthetic of the infected. Sure, it's almost a carbon copy of Poe's final form, but with crab claws. Yeah, it's a scorpion, I suppose. What else can I say? We're still pretty low down on the list, and I've already covered all of the newborn forms from survival. Kinda pushes my point across, I guess. They could have done so much more interesting things with these guys, but alas, there they are. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Tinky Winky deserved so much better. <sighs> what to say about Tinky Tank? So. Tinky Winky was the main character in the first game, and is widely known as the poster child for the series. And this enemy is supposedly his final form, after consuming, or rather merging, with the final infected custard in the mainland. Firstly, why show a final form after the first form was so terrifying? Secondly, this form is not more terrifying or threatening despite his new face, kind of reminds me of BBB from ONAF 2. A larger and more muscular enemy does not immediately mean scary for all you games designers out there. But if you have to have a larger character, there are more frightening ways to go about it. Think Siren Head and his tall slender figure. What I'm trying to say is, this version of the character was such an anticlimax. Not to mention that after his appearance chasing you to the mountains or caves in the campaign, you never see him again. That was it. He doesn't slowly follow you, he doesn't appear in a last minute boss fight, unless you count multiplayer as canon, which it technically is, or isn't, I don't know. For me, it was a character wasted. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Imagine fighting a loudspeaker in a mech suit. Here it was, the storm before the hurricane, the penultimate boss fight that we were all waiting for. Except we kind of weren't. The fact that there were any boss fights in the campaign at all for me was a bit of a disappointment, but I can see where Zeroworks was going. I mean, look at the first game. There's no way anyone can tell me nearly four years ago, hey Sauron, guess what? There's going to be a story mode sequel to Slendy Tubbies where you fight a giant robot in an underground sci-fi base with a chainsaw! Yeah, exactly. However, I'll let it slide, despite my gripe being a main plot point of the game. The reveal was certainly surprising, and wasn't spoiled by the teaser trailer. It was also a nice revelation fight, right after finding out who the main villain was. You know, having the announcer be an enemy is just such major fan servicing, but done in the wrong way. Think back to the first game. There was a subtle, creepy aspect to their existence, how they stood there menacingly and broken. In fact, there is another example earlier in the campaign itself in Chapter Zero. Poe turns to look around her whilst being chased, and the speaker is just there, speaking, in a broken tone. Its subtle presence is so much better than whatever this was. To sum up, I wanted to see the announcer in the game, I didn't want it shoved in my face. Where have the Teletubbies gone? 
Well, this guy's definitely an imposter for being in a horror game. Before I rip into this guy, I am actually a big fan of his design. The shiny metal body, long sword to match, and a tubby custard interior. He just isn't that scary. Honestly, when playing the collect map for this guy, which in itself is frankly bizarre, it doesn't feel like you're playing a tense horror game anymore, and instead feels like a sci-fi action escape game. He doesn't scream like the other characters and instead just beeps like a broken soundboard. He also doesn't have any backstory yet, meaning I can't discuss his link to the Guardian, which is pretty much clear from the get-go, but for now, I can tolerate him. Where have the Teletubbies gone? You know, the backstory to these guys is more messed up than you could possibly imagine. Okay, it's finally time to get into the better characters in the game. Trust me, the positives in the following enemies will almost certainly outshine the negatives of the previous. So let's start off with these little abominations. I'll be honest, these guys freaked me out the first time I came into contact with them in the sewers of Slendy Tubbies 2, and became kind of fascinated by their existence within the game. Then Slendy Tubbies 3 rolled around, and the truth behind these guys is genuinely unsettling. We all know that the custard was infected, and that's why Tinky Winky and the gang appeared the way they did, with that devious Dyson ripoff. To create the newborns, he had been injecting the infected custard straight into the machines that created the Teletubbies, basically infecting newborn babies with a death disease that turns you into a bloodthirsty monster. Wow, what a jerk. Even though the original map wasn't implemented into the latest game, there was a nod to it in Chapter 1, which was relatively creepy. Although I might not be a massive fan of the oversaturation and survival mode, it makes sense to me to make them the main threat at the end of the game. I just wish they didn't cancel the DLC because the newborns would have played such a pivotal role. Regardless, these guys are still pretty low on the list because nothing will compare to the monoliths yet to come. Where have the Teletubbies gone? I still don't get how he uses that chainsaw. Ah, Dipsy, my least favourite of the famous four. This character is heavily inspired by his fate in the first game, where the guy literally got decapitated on the slide. I don't know how this happened, but you know, it's not really important. But of course, because of the infection, he becomes reanimated and is then encountered again in the secret centre. His weapon of choice? The chainsaw, which he then steal by blowing him up and go to defeat the announcer. Although it makes no sense that he's able to move, let alone chase down the player without a head, it is an interesting aspect that opens up some more questions about the disease. The most notable for me is how it's able to control the host without a brain. I might be looking too deep into this, and you know what, well, actually I definitely am because this is Slendy Tubbies, and it was only an homage to the first game. I don't know, I just want to know that sweet lore. Anyway, the reason Chainsaw Dipsy is this low on the list is because I just don't like what they did with him in the story. Don't get me wrong, I love that he's here and is the main threat inside the secret station. How he was able to brutally murder all the workers, including that poor neglected Ronald. <laughs> the real question is, how is he here? Plus, when he's finally defeated in his first form, he's never seen from again. No Lake Dipsy, no spooky moment where the Guardian realises he's still alive. You just steal his chainsaw and leave. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Something's fishy about this one? Okay, I'll stop now. Okay, we're officially halfway, and that means we're in the no man's land, or as I like to call the land of... Eh? This is Lake Dipsy, or as the wiki calls him, a lizard sea monster. What has this got to do with the plot in any way, other than it's because there's a map with a lake, I don't know. You see, this is where I think the devs got a bit too ambitious, both in theme and design choices. The characters in Slendy Tubbies 2 and 2D should have been taken as experiments, not references. Obviously there are some great enemies to come out of both of them, and some not great ones. Lake Dipsy seems to be a reskinned, recycled character. But to be fair to him, he is pretty scary, and he fits well with the theme of the lake. What more do you want me to say? Unfortunately, we never got to see this second form in the storyline, which bugs me because I really, 
really want to know how he got his head back. I'm sure you were wondering why I placed him higher on the list than Chainsaw Dipsy. Well, really it's because effort was put into this design. It might have been out of place, but hey, it looks pretty cool. Where have the Teletubbies gone? I've got one thing to say for this guy. Welcome to the Himalayas! I can't lie to you here, I think they did the gameplay for this guy really well. Like seriously. I love how you never really see the Yeti Tubby until you make a wrong move when trying to escape. The howling in the distance telling you which path to avoid is really great. It's not the scariest part of the game, more on that later, but it certainly must have had a good amount of thought put into it. I also like how he is intelligent enough to enslave a murderous droid sent out to kill him in order to get someone else to cook and kill for him. I don't even care that it makes no sense. It definitely proves that the infection is more complex than we might realise, almost like it has some form of its own consciousness. He's also one of the only infected characters to not attempt to brutally murder you straight away, building on some juicy character development. Throw in the lore with the Dorito Tubby and the Caveman and you've got a solid character. When we're talking about design, again, I have to say they did a fairly decent job with him, even if the fur is a bit weird. It perfectly fits the mountain, abominable snowman aesthetic that was aimed for, and he has a face of pure horror. We're getting closer to the best characters now, so why is this one so low down, considering all the things I've said about him? Well, the fact is, his encounter happened and ended so quickly with no real climax. The story of the Guardian should have been his journey through a nightmare land, defeating the monsters he encounters along the way. But I don't know if you've noticed, that doesn't happen with most of the characters, especially the good ones. What, you're telling me that one of the most intelligent enemies here just let the Guardian go after running a bit into the woods? Come on guys. I was ready to put this guy much lower on the list until I really had a think about him, and that shows how forgettable he was. But regardless, the Yeti is still a pivotal part of why I love this series so much. But we've still got a long way to go. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Oh, you know what? All I have to say is she had the best soundtrack. Please excuse me for bunching all her forms together like this. I won't be doing it for any other characters, and for good reason. But Poe I felt it would be difficult to rate them differently considering you see all her forms in a short amount of time during the campaign. So here they are, all in one place. Makes sense to me, I mean, all of them are the same character. Anyway, this is Poe, a surprisingly important character in the Stanley Tubby storyline. You start off the game playing as her, where we first discover that things have been going terribly, terribly wrong. And then depending on the ending you're going for, you find yourself confronting her as the final battle of the game. Seriously, one of the ending is achieved by being killed by her. One of them when you defeat her, and another when you change your mind about joining forces with Nunu, and then you're cut in half by her. I'm gonna forget about the announcer because he was a real nothing character, but I think Poe is Nunu's right hand, uh, Telly Tubby, the secondary antagonist. And this is actually more cleverly done than you might realize. Nunu might be evil scum, but he is intelligent. When or if you defeat the announcer, Nunu seems to change his mind about you, realizing you're stronger than he first thought. From there, you can join his side, or destroy him so he can't cause any more damage. I think a similar thing happened to Poe. In the beginning, she was the one who put up the best fight to escape from Tinky Winky. Not including La La if you don't wake her up and she escapes. I might be looking too deep into this, or maybe it was complete coincidence because Sean's favourite colour is red or something. Regardless, the fight with Poe at the end of the game is a real highlight of the game for me. Instead of being trapped in an enclosed space when fighting the announcer, you're given a proper fighting ground, where Poe's attacks will increase in damage the more you aggravate her. And let's not forget that soundtrack. <sighs> anyway, enough of the plot, more onto the designs. Nothing really of note for the first form, except that I was surprised to see her at the beginning of the battle. Think about it, someone had to cut her down from that tree. The next form is something that stuck with me, especially after playing Slender Tubbies 2. It's kinda cool that they found a different sound for her instead of a usual high-pitched scream. The weird scythe arms are also a nice addition to this alien insect-like design. Finally, we have the final form, some kind of giant tarantula monstrosity. 
Reminds me a lot of the Ragnos from Doctor Who. It's an interesting character for a fight and definitely works well for a final boss battle. A nice blend of nightmare fuel and intimidation. I think my gripe for this character in particular is the setting that the boss battle takes place in. I know I said I liked the open space for a battle, but it, it's not scary, considering it's broad daylight. Think back to any final boss fight in a horror game ever. I can guarantee you that they don't take place in a setting like this. I mean, if it wasn't for the invisible barrier, the Guardian could have easily run away. Oh, you know what, never mind. <clears throat> anyway, character placement for the enemies in this game have been surprisingly accurate and well crafted. Except for this one. Even the announcer's setting felt like a better place for a horror game. And I hate that fight. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Of course this absolute classic would get some spotlight. It's a shame they didn't do much with him. Ah, Tinky Winky, the favourite among many. For simplicity, I will talk specifically about the remade version of him used for the campaign, and not the original version. Tinky Winky is our main marker, the realisation that things are going so wrong. He wakes up in the night after eating the infected custard, destroys the custard machine, and leaves the house. Poe wakes up to this revelation and follows him into the night. Upon encountering him, his face is twisted into a menacing, hollow scream. He proceeds to kill off all the other Teletubbies, and then targets you as you look for the custard. He runs around in a crazed rampage, trying to kill as many people as possible. I often wondered why he destroyed the custard machine instead of killing them in their sleep. I think that he wasn't fully transformed yet, destroyed the custom machine to prevent anyone else from eating, and then tried to get away to prevent his infectious instinct. Of course that, you know, didn't really work out for him. He appeared in the first and second chapters, and are obviously the highlights of the game, but as I've mentioned already, Tinky Tank is a pretty weird character for the end of the chapter, and then we never hear from him again. I get that they wanted to put as many characters as possible into this game, but having such an influential character with so little screen time in the game was a little bit of a disappointment. Where have the Teletubbies gone? I don't know who this guy is, but I love him. This is the Arrow Tubby. Or as the fandom likes to call him, Doritos. He is probably the only canon character in the game that wasn't given so much as a reference, except for the crudely drawn diary entry you can find in the cave. I'm leaving Shadow Tubby out of this because he was in the DLC demo and clearly hinted at at the beginning of the game. Instead, you can find him in the training maze, a unique canon map that was also not included. Hmm. Well, lack of lore aside, I have to say, I'm a big fan. The map he inhabits is one of the scariest maps in the game. It feels a lot like the cave, for example, where you can't tell what's around the corner. But this time, it's all industrial, meaning someone made this place for a reason. It's also been confirmed that the map itself is indoors, which alludes even more to the whole experiment theory. Whether it was made by the military to study the behaviour of the infected in an effort to defeat them, or maybe made by Nunu to train his creations, we may never know because the fucking DLC was cancelled. This is a further example of the types of characters that this game lacked. Tall and skeletal, with bright orange fur. His growls are terrifying and you have nowhere to run but further into the maze. Clearly, he belongs in this game. When moving on from one game to another, you'd expect there to be new enemies and bigger threats. It seems to me that Zeoworks just wanted to use as many of the previous characters as possible. This character is an example of a character we needed. We needed this character to build some mystery around the game, because we are always more scared of the unknown. Where have the Teletubbies gone? I love the fact that Zeoworks had the audacity to kill its main character in three out of the four endings. First of all, I want to say how grateful I am that Zeoworks programmed in multiple endings for the game. It really made it feel like a proper campaign. Not only that, but you can choose to be the bad guy. After all you've been through, after all the horrors you've encountered, you still have the option to join forces with the opposition. 
to become the strongest of them all. The dynamic between the Guardian and Nunu is quite brilliant, like how the evil mastermind can manipulate and coerce you into becoming a monster. Sure, the pacing is a bit fast, but that's because they only had four chapters to work with. It's my strong belief that aspects of this would have been used in the DLC, where the Guardian has to fight not only the infected, but also his own sanity. Surely you realise there was no real way out of it. As soon as the infection was released, a chain reaction was sparked with no hope of containment. And this revelation for the plot is the reason this character is so high up on the list. Sure, he might not be that scary, but it's the thought idea that prevails here. For me, the evil guardian is the full stop at the end of the story, because no matter how hard the guardian can fight against the infection, he won't be able to keep up much longer. At some point, he will die, and he will become the monster. It's inevitable. It makes you feel like the most important character in the story because if he of all people goes, the rest will follow. The military can't stop it, and neither can you. Okay, that was a bit of a tangent, but I needed to get it out there. His design is simple, but effective. The hollow eyes show how his soul has been lost to the disease, and the evil inside finally comes out into the open. The reveal of this character in the evil ending was unexpected, but I'm really happy it's here. Now, if only they did more with him. He didn't even get an end credits cutscene, and that's really the only reason he's number 8. That, and we never got to see his final form. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Now, if you want a character to be scared of, and feel sorry for at the same time, oh, have I got someone for you. With the inclusion of a real, concrete storyline, we really needed to bring some emotion into the plot. And with that, I give you Lala and her story. I'd argue she has suffered more than any of the other characters combined. Let me explain. In the beginning, if you wake her up to look for Tinky Winky, she will be brutalised by him off camera for Poe to discover next to the lake. She then reappears in the outskirts when you can cause a pillar to collapse onto her, trapping her. You can choose to smash her head in and put her out of her misery, or you can leave her to suffer an eternal agony, never being allowed to die. If you don't wake her up, she will escape to the outskirts, but not after watching all her friends die. Realising that the infected custard is beginning to take her over, she collapses where you can either let her turn into the monster she was so afraid of, or you can take her life to prevent the world from causing her any more suffering. Oh by the way, she was the one who had the nightmare about being chased by Shadow Tubby. She was the one who found out she had been monitored her whole life, and her imaginary friend is a dead possessed school kid. Seriously, give Lala a break. I'm so glad we have a character like this. It really strengthens this idea of an unorthodox experiment going horribly wrong. In the end, she was a lab rat. They all were. And no matter how hard you try, you can't save them. They're expendable. You don't even have to be nice to them. You can force them to obey your commands. You are the guardian, playing god in your own little world. That was pretty deep, so what's cool about Lala's design? What stands out the most to me is the animation and movement. The way she shakes and flails her long arms violently is incredibly disturbing. With the exclusion of the training maze, Lala's map in Slendy Tubbies 2 was probably the scariest, so it makes sense to have it included in some form in this game. In the campaign, it says that Lala has scratched out her own eyes, and so is blind, but incredibly sensitive to sound. This is a very interesting mechanic, but unfortunately, during the gameplay it feels superficial. It doesn't matter because she still acts like any other character. If maybe the outskirts section had trigger points where a noise would be played attracting her attention, then this character might have been higher up on the list. Still, a fantastically scary and complex character that deserves respect. Uh, if only these guys could have been canon. After someone pointed out to me that Cleave and Clave weren't actually canon and were just glorified fan characters, I was genuinely disappointed. After their semi-debut as a cheap jump scare in Sunday Tubbies 2, they were promoted to real characters in 2D, with their little log cabin to inhabit. The twins have some backstory that I don't think many people are familiar with, but if you are then I apologise because I'm about to talk about exactly that. In a sort of SCP Slendy Tubbies hybrid way, these two are from a foursome of characters called the Twisted Tubbies. 
unlike much of the Slendy Tubbies lore, they are not infected and are literally cannibals. Having Slendy Tubbies who aren't infected and are just generally violent psychopaths is even more chilling than the infected when you think about it. And although I'm not a massive fan of Spin and Bardo, the fact that these OCs managed to make a name for themselves in the series really warms my heart. Gameplay wise, there are two of them, first and foremost, which is always fun. Bored of one murderous Teletubby chasing you? Yeah, how about two? They're also a little bit faster than most of the infected, meaning you have to stay extra cautious. Characters like these are what the series needed more of, not going in the direction of crazy mutant monsters, but more in the way to be subtly evil, because these guys didn't even need the infected custard to be monsters. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Now, Slendy Tuppies 3 might not have been as scary as its earliest predecessor, but oh my god, stay away from the caves. Out of all of the new characters from any of the Slendy Tubby sequels, the Cave Tubby or the Distorted Tubby is hands down the scariest. I am not even kidding. When replaying the third game's campaign in preparation for this video, the cave was still tense as hell. Combining him with the creepiest map that Slendy Tubbies has ever seen, and you've got an enemy worth being in a great horror game. The Cave Tubby was an example of making an enemy bigger to be threatening done right. Despite this, his scariest feature is his face. I can see why they used to call him the Distorted Tubby. As I've mentioned, making an enemy bigger does not make them immediately more scary, if done incorrectly. But this guy's done well because of the unequal proportion. I mean, just look at how wide that mouth is. I wish I could have seen an explanation to why he's in the cave in the first place. More so why all the diary pages are here. Was it his? The story here in Slendy Tubbies feels unfinished, and the more I think about it, the more upset I get about the cancellation of the DLC. Let's move on before I start crying. Where have the Teletubbies gone? I bet this one is higher up on the list than you expected. Don't worry, let me explain. Obviously this video is just one big spoiler, but I'm still going to put out a warning. Spoilers. Okay, with that out of the way, onto the Crawler Tubby. The Crawler Tubby came into the canon universe at the end of the regretful ending. If you choose at the last moment to refuse the infected custard by Nunu, you will instead be tossed off the side of the building into a vat of the custard by Poe, ripping the Guardian's torso in two. This doesn't kill the poor guy, of course, because soon the infection overrides him, turning into the horrific abomination you see before your eyes. I gotta be honest, this reveal was amazing, but I wouldn't have been anywhere near as impressed if I hadn't seen the Crawler Tubby before. He was introduced in 2D as a main enemy, and even in this game, he was a great addition, so making him canon was a real highlight for me. When talking about the behaviour of this character, he is very fast, despite not having legs. The squeaky rasping and wailing that this character creates when chasing you is strange, albeit very disturbing. I wondered why his voice was suddenly so high-pitched, and then I realised this half of the body is missing. If you know, you know. I gotta say Zia works. Either that was a coincidence, or you are, you know what, it doesn't matter. So why is this character so high up? Higher up than the cave tubby of all characters. Nearly making it into the top three. Well, as you might have noticed by now, I value gameplay and lore pretty much equally. And as I've mentioned already, that reveal of who this character really is manages to outshine the cave tubby scariness. I'm serious, I was taken aback when that happened. Anyway, you're all gonna guess what I have to say, and that's that the Crawler Tubby wasn't used nearly enough. Maybe he would have been in the DLC, but we'll never know. Come on, Zeoworks, I'll, I'll pay money to play this DLC. I, I don't care if it's cancelled, just please, I need some. Okay, we're moving on to the top three now, so I might as well apologise here if your favourite character didn't make it. But just remember, this is my list and my opinions alone. And yes, again, I'll apologise for Ron, yeah, I'm sorry. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Yes, he was behind everything. I want to put this one out there. I saw this one coming. As soon as I saw him ominously standing by the lake, I just knew. Don't believe me? Here's a clip from my Slendy Tubbies 3 trailer analysis. Oh, and you got to put Nunu in somewhere. 
He's behind everything. No! Away! No! Now either all the signs were there, and it was incredibly obvious, or I'm just a psychic. Regardless, that reveal in the satellite station was something else. Coming face to face with the unlikely villain for the first time. Now playing through the game, you'll meet your fair share of horror and danger. But this guy, he's pure evil. Okay, so Tingy Winky killed three people and tried to kill you. Well, Nunu killed them all. And then used them to kill others. And killed newborn infants. And used them as weapons. Yeah, this guy sucks. And yes, I can hear your keyboards typing furiously in the comments. Why is Nunu even on the list considering you don't directly fight him, he isn't scary and isn't playable in any game mode? But listen, how could I not? He is the main villain after all. And when we're talking about scary, it's the thought that counts. This AI was obviously made by the military, or humans, so maybe all of this was intentional. Doomed to fail. Maybe the experiments supersede everything we know so far. Or maybe there's another mastermind out there, controlling everything. Here is my theory. Humans aren't dead. To test the limits of these primitive minds, their personal responses, their military action, their morals. How closely do they resemble humans? And what would a human society do in the same scenario? The world of Slender Tubbies is crumbling, and they are letting it happen. But that's just a game theory. Now this is a character to fear. <laughs> the very concept of this character is the stuff of nightmares, quite literally. And the fact that this character might actually exist within the game is just terrifying. His map is much more unique than the other maps in that it's a completely flat plane with checkerboard tiling. The map is pitch black, with the exception of paths of light where the custards will be placed. And of course, there's the shadow tubby stalking you in the dark. The only part of him you can easily see is the glowing TV on his stomach, and the bright, wide grin. You never know when he's coming for you. Now, you can judge the flat map and call it lazy, but I think it makes for a more nightmarish setting, because you don't truly have anywhere to hide. There are countless theories and speculations about this character, but we can confirm his existence by the references to Lala's dream in Chapter Zero and the vision the Guardian had in the DLC demo. What it seems to me is that the individual who orchestrated this infection is experimenting with new ways to attack the living, having a monster that can attack you from the inside, a mental link so to speak. With this, the Shadow Tubby may be able to attack at any moment and without warning which is easily more unsettling than any other method of attack from any other character. Alas, I have to give criticism where it's due, despite how much I love this character. The concept of Shadow Tubby works perfectly in concept, but in practice, there are a few issues. For one, the render distance means that you can sort of make out wherever he is at all times. I'm unsure if this is a texture or model issue, but it's one that really needs to be fixed. It's the only thing that troubles me, and it's more of a map issue than a character issue, and I love this character. He could have easily been at the top of the list, but there's one more I think that deserves this spot. I hope you're prepared, because here comes number one. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Let's be honest, you all knew this one was coming. Okay, okay, I cheated here, but the opportunity was there and my god I had to take it. The classic Tinky Winky. Of course it would be him. The proxy main antagonist. Playable in sandbox console and even has his own designated map. The only working enemy character to make through every single title in the series. Now, you might be wondering how this guy is any different from the remastered versions in Slender Tubby's 3 or 2. Well, it's down to his behaviour. You see, there are a couple of tropes that he had in the first game that made him 600 times more frightening. The fact he could see you from almost anywhere on the map. The way he was able to find you no matter how far you ran. The way he ran T-posing over the hills to get to you. The way it was the sight of him that killed you, not the touch. He could duplicate to chase the amount of players in the lobby. And that... scream. 
I can tell you're all angry at me for this one, and at the top of the list no less, but technically he isn't canon in the third game, and if it makes you feel better, Shadow Toppy is my favourite unique antagonist from any of the games. Regardless, the classic Tinky Winky shall be, and always will be, my favourite character. If I'm being honest and personal here, this character and the game he was in is almost the sole reason why I like horror games today. It's the reason Slender Tubbies isn't just one of my favourite fan series, but game series in general. From that fateful day in 2016 where I played it with Callum for the first time and forgot to record, I knew there was something about the genre that appealed to me. And thank you Zeoworks for making this my life. I'll never be able to forget those screams. Hello everyone, thank you everyone for watching this video. This is uh, probably the longest uh, heavily edited video I've ever made on the channel. Anyway, uh, I want to say thank you if you made it this far, because obviously <laughs> I spent a long time on this video. The script was 11 pages long. I think that's because the font size was really big, but I spent three solid days editing this, so thank you for your patience. Uh, I know I said I'd get it out at some point, but um, I, don't want to, I don't know what else to say. Thank you for making it this far. It's, you know, this has been a real passion project for me. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed. So, thank you everyone for watching this video and uh, let me know uh, your lists down in the comments so that I know you've made it this far. <laughs> uh, what's your favourite character? I want to know. I want to know. I'll get back to regular uploads at some point. <laughs> I'll see you all in the next one guys. Goodbye. <laughs>